Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2012 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Mr. Jack Brink. Jack is the curator of archaeology at the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton. Jack obtained his undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota. He then moved to Edmonton to pursue a master's degree in anthropology at the University of Alberta. For his thesis, Jack conducted a microscopic study of stone tool use. Over the years, Jack studied bison biology and how it relates to aboriginal hunting strategies for a PhD, and he will be awarded an honorary doctorate from Athabasca University in June of this year. Jack has worked in the field of archaeology for more than 35 years. His special areas of interest are the archaeology of the Northern Plains, in particular communal hunting of game animals, buffalo jumps, and aboriginal rock art. He was a member of the team that developed the Interpretive Center at Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump Provincial Park and the New Visitor Center at Riding on Stone Provincial Park. His 2008 book on, head smashed in bu on the Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump site has won six awards, including the Society for American Archaeology Prize for Best Popular Book of the Year, and similar awards from the Archaeological Institute of America and the Canadian Archaeological Association. Today, Jack will discuss a, a topic that, was, that we rarely hear, hear about, pronghorn hunting by ab aboriginal people. Pronghorns, or American antelopes, are the fastest land animals in North America today. Despite their speed, these wild animals were hunted in large numbers by ancient Aboriginal people of southern Alberta for thousands of years, often in dramatic fashion. In his talk, Jack will present new evidence for ancient Aboriginal pronghorn hunting and discuss how these remarkable kills were conducted. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Jack Brink. Thanks, and uh, good to see you all. Um, I have a number of friends in the audience, and of course, have a strong sister or brother affiliation with our uh, various institutions. So, thank you for inviting me down and for uh, thinking outside the paleontological box a little bit, I guess, to uh, include archaeology in your series. Uh, always pleased to come here and, and share my. Uh, uh, my research with uh, my colleagues. The focus is today on, on archaeology, but I will be, um, I'll be talking a fair bit about animal biology and behavior, which I hope will be of interest to a uh, number of people in the audience, and thinking about um, how that, those aspects of uh, wildlife studies tie into uh, the human exploitation of a species like antelope, uh, many of you probably know me better from my studies of, uh, of bison behavior, biology, and how that came to play in a communal uh, buffalo jump. Uh, certainly one of the most dramatic and best known types of archaeological sites probably on the continent. Uh, lesser known is the fact that um, uh, many other game animals were hunted, uh, as we say, communally. And when we say that, we mean by large numbers of people. Um, hunting large numbers of animals at one time, as opposed to individual stalking and things like that. Uh, bison were the most spectacular and left the largest amount of residue, especially archaeological residue, where the, uh, the sites from these uh, activities are massive in size and proportion, often depth and age and weight and in, in terms of kilograms and all the rest. Uh, many other species were hunted that don't leave that kind of mark on the landscape. And in fact, in particular for pronghorn, uh, the animals are so small that they were, uh, the, the evidence we have for hunting them uh, um, is extremely minimal. And uh, the evidence suggests that they were largely not butchered at the places they were killed. Uh, they were typically taken away by the hunters to some other location because you can pick up and walk away with an antelope on your shoulders uh, without too much trouble. <clears throat> in particular, say if you cut the head off and open the body cavity and let out some of the liquids and the blood and the guts if you don't happen to want those. Uh, becomes a very lightweight carcass. And uh, so pronghorn kills are, are typified by an absence of evidence, <laughs> which makes them rather hard to identify in the archaeological record. But one of the things we do have that indicates uh, that type of hunting technology uh, are features that people left on the landscape. 
and I'm going to show you uh, one example of that today and talk a bit about that kind of a, of a kill and how I think those uh, may have happened, which is, um, involves a fair bit of speculation on my part. Uh, so really what I'm here to talk about, as much as anything, is um, pre Aboriginal knowledge. Uh, we're talking about behavior and um, uh, the, um, the manipulation of, of, a lands of landscape variables and attributes of large game animals, or in this case, medium to small game animals, uh, by Aboriginal hunters to bring about something for their own well-being, but that doesn't leave a large um, mark on the landscape, except in ways that they may have actually transformed the nature of the land itself. And in some cases, in particular on the Northern Plains, we now know of two instances where they did this, uh, only two. And um, I'm going to show you and take you to one of them today. But it isn't a talk that involves arrowheads and piles of bones and excavations and many of the things you might associate uh, with a typical, typical archaeological study. This is more about um, looking at what's on the land and thinking about it and thinking about how it worked and trying to put together pieces of a, of a very old puzzle. And it, so it sort of requires us to think back to a time uh, which is difficult to do, I think, for for all of us to think back to a, a time and a place and a series of situations where there was just you and your group of people and a very wide open landscape in front of you. And on that landscape were the resources that you used to uh, survive from year to year, season to season, generation to generation. Um, these communal kills were really pretty dramatic things and they may have been extraordinarily important in dictating the survival of um, tribal groups uh, from 10, 12,000 years ago, right up until the time of European contact. But if you think about it, uh, put yourself out on that, uh, the prairie landscape, which uh, you in the audience here are very familiar with, a very dry, uh, desiccated land uh, with animals roaming around it, and you have to bring some group of them to a pinpoint destination on that landscape. Uh, without pickup trucks, without high-powered rifles, and many of the other things we take for granted. So today, as much as anything, I'm going to talk about uh, how we think that happened, how did they pull this off, and show you a place where, uh, I should emphasize, where I think, <laughs> I think they did this. Um, they certainly did something, and they left behind some substantial archaeological remains. Uh, but what actually happened there is... Um, I'm not sure we'll ever know the complete story. So let me begin. Um, we're going to talk a bit about antelope, uh, or, or pronghorn as they're, more, as they're more appropriately known. Um, they have lived uh, in, in um, Alberta and on the Great Plains for a great length of time. They are native to this landscape. Uh, they lived in harmony with bison herds and perhaps in numbers that were equal to the bison herds. That comes as a surprise to many people. Uh, they were, just like bison, we don't know the numbers of, of pronghorn that lived on the Great Plains prior to even human presence, uh, but, but the evidence suggests it was in the millions to tens of millions. So 10, 15, 20 million are figures you will see in the literature, uh, somewhat less perhaps than bison, but, but not by a lot. <clears throat> in other words, these were extremely common, well-represented animals in the faunal landscape here. The uh, pre-contact distribution of these animals uh, is, is quite extensive. They went from southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, as sort of the nor northern extent of their home range, to uh, the northern parts of Mexico. Uh, that is no longer true. Um, the Great Plains, the northern plains, have remained a home for, for pronghorn, but um, not in the southern distribution is constricted dramatically. So they are really confined today to parts of the central and northern Great Plains and to the uh, Great Basin, or Desert West, as it's often called. Uh, I know I have a lot of animal experts in the room, so I, I, I won't go through as many details as I might with other, although I suppose this isn't your particular animal of um, expertise, but coming through wildlife backgrounds, and, or backgrounds that involve more biology and animal science, uh, you, you all know that they're misnamed. They are not true antelope. 
uh, antelope are confined to Africa. And uh, these were misnamed, uh, but the name has stuck, and so most of us, including me, use antelope and pronghorn interchangeably. Uh, these animals of the Great Plains have a pronged uh, forward-facing horn, hence the name, uh, and it sheds the horn sheath annually, which the true pronghorn of Africa do not. Uh, they're an um, artiodactyl mammal. They've been here for at least four million years, uh, possibly longer, so they, are, they have evolved here. They are, um, this is their home. The first scientific specimen was collected by Lewis and Clark. Uh, and brought back uh, from their western trek. And they, um, uh, they are credited with the first discovery of, of or description of, of antelope or pronghorn. That would be about 18, somewhere between 1804 and 1806. They are notoriously small, of course. Uh, you've got the size dimensions here. I won't read them all out. They're not, they are not big animals. And they, um, as I said, can be carried by a single individual when they've been killed, and if you're fairly strong, and in particular if you want to cut a few parts off and leave them behind, like lower distal limbs and things that really have uh, no food value. Uh, they top out uh, males or bucks around 110, 120 pounds, 50 to 55 kilograms or so, and that's pretty much full size. They're not very long-lived animals. Eight, nine-year-old antelope is, a, is an old antelope. Uh, but they, um, uh, they twin, and so the population uh, does, does, tends to stay fairly healthy. Twinning is normal uh, for pronghorn. You'll see that they're not particularly prone to sexual dimorphism, um, unlike most of the other Great Plains mammals. Uh, a, a, a noticeable size in, uh, um, advantage for males, but not, not particularly strong, certainly nothing like bison and some of the other animals. Uh, fawns are, are very tiny at birth, uh, but like other animals that depend on movement for their survival and for their livelihoods, uh, they grow very quickly, in particular in terms of their skeletal framework and muscles associated with motion. Within 20 minutes of dropping uh, from, the ground, from the mother, they can walk, and within a, an hour or two, they can move around. And within a day or two, they can run 25 kilometers an hour. Uh, a number of things are important for us in terms of um, aboriginal hunting of these animals. And um, I'm trying to highlight some of those as I go through a few of the details here, because uh, I'm obviously leaving a lot of things about the animal out. Uh, but I'm trying to show you things that uh, are relevant to uh, people chasing these things and tracking them down and moving them towards a particular destination. And one of the most important things is that they are gregarious. They're herd animals. They live and work and stay in groups. Um, only at certain times of the year are a few of the pop, uh, subgroups of the population relatively isolated, and that's um, the does when they calve. They will go off on their own, uh, or sometimes one or two or three. But they, they seek isolation and will go off by themselves. And of course, they're particularly vulnerable to predation at that time. But if you're a hunter, that's not much of a return. And so um, the, um, the, the communal hunts tended to focus on large groups and when they, were, uh, when they gathered. And that typically for pronghorn is in the uh, uh, wintertime. They are prone to uh, segregation uh, in the summer and spring and congregation in the fall and winter. Uh, the herds are nothing like the size of bison herds that we're familiar with from the Great Plains, not the tens of thousands to perhaps millions that uh, historic um, ethnographic accounts report. But pronghorn certainly gathered in the hundreds. Uh, there are reports of thousands, but that's rare. Uh, groups of dozens and dozens is very common. Uh, and there are, there are modern statistics. There's a lot of antelope studies, of course, going on today on herd characteristics. But how representative that is of times where there were 20 or 15 million of them, we can't really say. Today, there's about a half a million pronghorn on the Great Plains and in the, great, uh, the desert of the Great Basin. They are migratory animals, although not profoundly so, and not, um, uh, I guess, not driven to be migratory like, say, caribou or something. Uh, they will, they're more opportunistic migrators. They will migrate when there's a good reason to do so, and if there's really no good reason to do so, they will not. 
uh, if feed is good and water is good and uh, predators or some other harassment like insects are not particularly um, uh, bad at any particular season of the year and imp importantly snow cover is not a problem, uh, they will tend to stay put. And they've studied uh, pronghorn, they've moved seven or eight kilometers in a whole year. And they've studied, this is, I'm sorry, <laughs> studied radio collared uh, herds that move uh, two to three hundred kilometers in a year. And it really depends on things like snow cover, available food, uh, sorry, um, and her degrees of harassment and uh, by both predators and insects and things like that. Uh, so they, in, in the northern plains, they tend to be not very migratory. Uh, so for example, our part of the world, and that's because it's a relatively good environment. Uh, there's uh, good food here, good graze, and uh, where they tend to be more migratory are parts of like Nevada, Utah, and um, parts of Wyoming, where it's, um, the food cover is, is much more thin and they tend to have more predictable migratory patterns. In fact, of the few archaeological sites we know of that are, that are demonstrably antelope kill sites, uh, most of them are located in Wyoming and, and a couple in Montana, and most of them are associated with what are clearly um, repeated uh, predictable migration routes from summer to winter ranges. That's less true on the northern plains where we believe pronghorn did not move nearly as much. Certainly they don't today, and we don't think they probably did in the past. Uh, they're a wonder, you know, they're, they're incredibly neat animals, and they, uh, they are just supremely adapted to life on the Great Plains, perhaps more than any other mammal, large mammal anyway. There might be a few really small uh, ground-dwelling things that are equally plains adapted, but much more so than bison, this is your quintessential plains animal. They don't, they don't even leave the plains in the winter like most animals do. They don't have to. Uh, they, are, they like being out in the wide open country. They're adapted for that in every sense of um, their physical and psychological and behavioral uh, developments. And so um, uh, most other animals like deer, moose, uh, bison, elk, uh, if they're out on the Great Plains, they will seek shelter in wintertime. They'll move to protected coolies. They'll move to uplands, hills. Uh, valleys, things like that. Um, antelope often don't. They will simply stay out. As long as there's not a lot of snow cover and there's food, uh, they can and will stay out on the open plains through an entire brutal winter. They're, and they're adapted for doing that through a whole variety of mechanisms. Not all of which I'll review here, but a couple things. For example, they have a tremendously uh, well insulating hair cover. Uh, the hairs, like caribou, are hollow and so provide great insulation both from extreme heat in summer and from extreme cold in winter. They can even move their hairs up and down. They can raise them and lower them to regulate uh, body temperature so they can let heat out and they can keep it in. They are gifted with extraordinary vision. Um, one of the best sighted animals probably in North America, uh, of, of a land dwelling animal anyway. It's almost 360 degrees and uh, if you look at the um, I'm not sure if I have a good shot of that. No, I guess I don't. Uh, a close-up of a face, you can see the eyes are really uh, protrude out of the, of the face. And the, the result of that is you can see almost 360 degrees. The vision is extremely acute. They can spot uh, something moving and unusual in their environment from several kilometers away and will continue to fix at it and watch it for long periods of time. Uh, the eyes are much bigger uh, relative to their body size. They have the, actually the biggest eyes of any um, animal in North America. They, um, uh, they detect movement at a great distance, and that's really a, a key point for human hunters. The animals are very well sighted, but, if, um, but what they're particularly attuned to is motion. And of course, that makes sense. If you're looking for predators, you're looking for something that's moving by and large. And so um, aspects of movement in particular will attract the attention of pronghorn, whereas um, uh, stationary objects can tend to be, they will investigate and they'll look, but they will tend to ignore them much more so than something that's moving. Uh, they also have a very keen sense of smell and can smell you if you are upwind from a number of kilometers away and will re react to that in a way that is not generally conducive for your uh, stalking and hunting purposes. As Francois said, they're noted for their speed. Uh, they're fastest land mammal in North America by far, and 
the second la fastest land mammal, second fastest land mammal in the world, behind only the cheetah. In fact, a particularly strange guy uh, in Wyoming once dragged a cheetah out in his car, and uh, I know this from a friend of mine who was there, wanting to see whether the cheetah was actually faster than uh, an antelope or whether the antelope was faster. And so he let this thing out when there was some antelope in the area, and of course, being a, a predator, it, it took off after one. And according to the eyewitnesses, it was uh, closing in on an antelope and gaining ground, suggesting it was faster. But then a chasm, in the, this is Wyoming, a chasm in the landscape showed up that was, you know, a gully 20 feet across or something. And the antelope went bounding across it in one jump. They are tremendous broad jumpers. And uh, the cheetah came screeching to a halt. And that was the end of the contest, uh, which I don't think um, probably met with the you know, approval of the PETA people or anything like this. This was a long time ago. <laughs> it was in the 1940s or, or so. But they are, they are supremely adapted for running, and again, in a whole variety of ways, and I've put a few of them on the slide here, uh, but left a lot of them out. It's, um, they have extraordinarily large trachea, lungs, and heart. Again, the biggest of any animal of their size range, uh, all for uh, extended uh, running and for you know taking in great amount of air as they do so, and for stamina as they run, uh, their the hooves of of the pronghorn are padded so that they can run over stony ground. Uh, they have uh, extremely small, dense, gracile uh, leg bones that um, uh, the density is is um, considered to be an adaptation for the torque that they put on them. When these things wheel and uh, and kick in high gear, they're known for their sprints. They will lope along next to a car at say, you know, um, 50 kilometers an hour or so, just literally running, and you think this is full speed, and then suddenly kick in another gear, and you can see them just sort of bend down and then dig in and leap forward. And there's tremendous stress put on their leg bones, but they, uh, they're adapted for that with uh, extraordinarily uh, dense leg bones. And, they have a, a, a very straight way of running. I'm sure mo all of you probably have seen pronghorn run somewhere outside of your car. And unlike, unlike deer and other animals that have more of, of a, a prong to them or a, a, a jump to them as they run, uh, pronghorn are very straight, very, very straight-backed um, and, and run that way. Uh, and, they, and as you can imagine, then they will jump forward a great distances and, and can broad jump um, you know, 10 meters or so, 5, 10 to, uh, 5 to 10 meters. Uh, but they are not well suited for jumping over things, and they don't like doing that. As again, I'm sure most of you know, you've seen them uh, scoot under barbed wire fences more than you've seen them jump over them. Although, of course, you know, they, four million years of evolution without fences, uh, and then suddenly they're faced with them. They are, they are starting to jump over fences more now. Uh, and I've seen them do it when they're running with deer. I've seen them jump over uh, barbed wire fences, but I've seen them go under them a lot more than, than go over them. So these um, are just beautifully adapted animals for, for living on the plains and for speed, for running. Uh, when they run, they do tend to run as groups, and, and females are generally the leaders of those groups, and males generally bring up the rear. Although, when you're talking about a sizable, sizable group, it's almost always a winter herd. Uh, they're simply not in sizable groups any other time of the year. And for when the sizable groups run, there aren't very many males there. They're mostly off on their own. These are does. And, uh, and fawns, uh, by and large, throughout, through the winter, there will be a, a one, two, three-year-old males. But that, beyond that, there are not usually that many in the herd. Uh, when they run, although they run as a group, which is important for human um, stalking and hunting, uh, they run very different than, say, bison or um, uh, other gregarious herd animals. And uh, this slide, again, I, I stole this off the internet somewhere. Uh, but I, I liked it because it reminded me of a number of times I've come across pronghorn herds uh, in, on the open plains and watched what they do, and it's, it's really kind of chaos. You know, it's kind of a um, uh, scattering of animals. Uh, they literally bolt, and they bolt with tremendous speed and, and agility, and, and uh, uh, it seems to me you just don't know where they're going to go. Now, of course, I, I haven't lived my whole life every moment of the day living out on the plains, where you watch them, and undoubtedly, Aboriginal hunters had a much greater idea what they were going to do when they bolted. But it's a very different process than when you see 
for example, a herd of bison suddenly spooked and start to move, uh, which resembles a lot like cattle moving across the, f the field or something. Uh, they are uh, extremely gregarious animals and will stay and move in large groups. Uh, pronghorn, uh, you'll, I've seen them move in large groups and I'm sure most of you have as well. Uh, but they also are known as just um, uh, unpredictable runners who will bolt and split in a number of directions and then they will reconvene. They tend to run in circles more rather than the straight lines. They will run in a line but it, it turns into a circle as they eventually come around back to where they began and I'll talk about that again in a moment or two. Now, pronghorn, um, uh, it's probably not an animal you think of so much when you think of aboriginal hunting uh, of, um, of game. And that's because it's not, that, not nearly as well known and partly because it was not nearly as popular or as common. Certainly in the Great Plains, that would be true. Bison were by far the preeminent animal, the staff of life as the cliche goes, and the cliche, like most, has a, a fair bit of truth in it. The pronghorn were by far a more um, subservient animal in terms of their importance as a resource in a variety of ways. They were not an important food source, clearly, um, given the weight of the animal, which, by the way, is about 1 16th of a bison, so you've got to kill 16 antelopes to get up to the, the, the weight of an average uh, buffalo. And uh, so they were not hugely important for, for food, but I think as we all know, native groups just about anywhere took advantage of just about everything in their environment, from every little squirrel, bat, or ground squirrel, or spider, or bug, uh, and berry, and root, and plant, and flower. And the same was true of, of game of, of every size. There was nothing that they didn't at least try to use in some way. And uh, pronghorn fits into that category. It provided a, an occasional change of diet, uh, which was probably welcome from time to time. It was a very different kind of meat. Some people today don't like it very much. I don't know if that was a factor in the past or not. Um, I, can't, I can't speculate on that. But uh, one important function of uh, hunting pronghorn was the hides. Uh, bison hide, of course, is good for some things. Teepee covers, moccasins, um, winter robes, blankets for sleeping. Uh, it's useless for clothing, of course. It's way too thick. Um, elk and um, deer and moose were much more popular. But if you wanted really fine hide, really fine uh, clothing, tailored clothing, made of the, the fanciest uh, parts of your wardrobe, uh, antelope was very clearly favored for that. There were some famous European explorers who came up the Missouri into the uh, Northern Plains, Montana, the Dakotas, and some of them into Alberta and Saskatchewan, who obtained tanned uh, antelope hides from native people, often highly decorated with um, things like uh, perforated elk teeth which were used as, um, in, in the days before trade of beads and things, it was a, a popular form of a pendant and decoration that was sewn on the clothing. Uh, a number of the Europeans reported, uh, reported coming, uh, meeting people who wore very fancy antelope hide, highly decorated, and they commented on what fine clothing it made. And clearly it was desired for that purpose. It does make um, very fine tailored clothing. So they, they were a consistent resource of some desirability. Uh, they were not nearly as popular or as important as bison, but it was a minor food source, uh, an important uh, alternative as a source of hides. And we know from archeological sites all across the Western United States, uh, not so much Canada, that they have been hunted for as long as people have been here. There are sites that are overwhelmed by bison and, and occasionally mammoth remains from the uh, uh, very early part of the Holocene, late Pleistocene. But in, in amongst those, uh, almost, I wouldn't say almost always, but frequently, there are the occasional antelope bones. People hunted them um, and added them to their diet for as long as they have been here. The problem is we just don't have a lot of evidence of them doing that. It's, um, it's an activity that doesn't have the physical remains of, say, a mammoth kill or a bison kill, which uh, clearly have um, a huge physical presence in terms of the sheer size and and visibility of the bone remains that come from that, and the durability. You know, the mammoth bones and bison bones are far more uh, likely to last in, um, in a not very conducive soil for preservation. Uh, for example, the Great Plains and the, and the Desert West, where sedimentation generally is very low. And so burial is slow, if it occurs at all, and, um, and it's almost uh, very rarely is it very deep, 
except in places like sedimentary basins of coulee bottoms and things like that. In, those, in the time that they have hunted pronghorn, they've devised an incredible variety of ways of doing that. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about all of them today, but one could because they are, uh, they are documented at least historically and ethnographically, not always archaeologically. Um, they stalk them individually, of course, with bows and arrows and before that with other weapons. That gets you one animal if you're lucky. And in many cases, we know that native people were looking for ways to kill large groups of animals at a single point in time. And the buffalo jump is probably the most dramatic and best known example of that, but far from the only uh, example of that kind of activity. And uh, this gives you a little bit of a, um, a range of the variation of, of tricks that these people used. Uh, like many animals, uh, pronghorn are not well adapted to snow. They have very narrow pointed feet. Um, the toes are very narrow and pointed. The legs are very slender unlike, say, caribou or moose, which have very splayed out hoofs and paws that um, catch a lot of snow and act as like little mini snowshoes. Pronghorns just sink right in snow. They avoid it uh, very carefully and very knowledgeably. And as I said, it's a major factor in their migrations. But Aboriginal hunters certainly understood that they were not well adapted to snow. Uh, they methodically uh, would trick them and move them into places of deep snow cover uh, and then once they get them in deep snow, the hunters were on snowshoes, uh, were able to slay um, great numbers of them, great numbers, you know, in the tens at any single time. Much like river crossings, uh, swimming across lakes, uh, pronghorn are excellent swimmers, again, partly relating to the, um, the, near, uh, sorry, the hollow nature of the hair, uh, which acts as a flotation. So all those hair follicles are just keeping them buoyant right up in the water. If you ever see them cross the river, I think you'll be quite surprised at how high up they, uh, they are in the water when they cross. And also that hair of theirs sheds water, it doesn't absorb it. So uh, they're excellent swimmers and uh, native people took advantage of the fact that they, you know, they knew frequent water crossing places and they would wait uh, until the animals are in the middle of the water and then swarm onto both shores and they've got nowhere to go except head up to some one of the areas of dry land and and to meet their, their fate at the hands of the hunters. Similar on, on ice, uh, snow drifts, ice, um, again, you're redu reducing the mobility of the animal, which is normally extraordinarily fleet, way faster than you. Uh, you could never hunt it um, without some kind of a turning of a trick. And uh, this list just gives you a few of those, um, all designed, in a sense, to take away the natural advantage of pronghorn uh, out on the Great Plains and to put some kind of a a leverage or an advantage back on your shoulders or your, in your hands uh, because otherwise you would be, I think, very hard pressed to um, track these animals. I think that's the point of the next slide here is that um, faced with uh, um, animals uh, at some point in the distance, uh, viewing them out, and this is a slide I took while working at the site I'm going to tell you about today, uh, antelope used to frequently come around and visit us while we were there. And I would look out at them and think, <laughs> I would not have a clue how to begin to get these animals to a pinpoint destination of a, of a clearly designed trap or kill site uh, that I want them to come to there. And you just shake your head thinking it would be, abs it would be absolutely hopeless, uh, I think, for any of us in the room. And probably for most even modern hunters. Uh, um, and so what that tells us is that there was a, there was a body of knowledge uh, that existed that um, I think some of it has been retained through um, interviews with Aboriginal elders and some of it uh, can be reconstructed from archaeological studies about how that was done uh, uh, and it involved things like a lot of luck and a lot of uh, care and probably strong uh, belief in the spiritual world and the spiritual help in guiding these animals to you and, and giving them to you essentially as many people talk about today. Uh, they had many tricks for, for moving and guiding animals uh, to a desired place. And one of them was to make yourself look like them. And um, uh, the use of disguise was relatively common and known. And I think I have a quote here. Yeah, um, I'll just, I don't, I don't like long quotes in, in papers or you know, speakers who do a lot of that. I have two for you today only, and that's it. Um, 
And so I'm going to read this for you as well. My attention was soon arrested by a number of antelope feeding on the plains. Crawling from bush to bush and hiding behind every stone, I got within handsome range of a fine buck. I always said, what's handsome range? You know, <laughs> For me, I was always ugly range but for any buck. I raised to fire when just as I was taking aim, I was astonished to see the animal raise erect on its hind legs and heard it cry out, don't fire, don't fire. What I would have sworn was an antelope proved to be a young Indian enveloped in an antelope skin. The Apache frequently adopt this method of hunting and imitate the actions of the antelope so exactly and so completely as to, so, sorry, so to completely as mislead those animals with the belief that their deadliest enemy is one of their number. And that's from a quote from a person who spent some time among the Apaches in the um, latter part of the 1800s. Uh, it was eerily familiar to me in, um, in that the literature I started reading 20 uh, to 30 years ago was about communal bison hunting. And I found a quote from a uh, early Western explorer who happened to be here uh, in time to still witness communal bison hunting, and this, in particular the rounding up and some of the tricks that were used. And, and, and in relation to the use of a disguise by Aboriginal hunters, he said, uh, and I don't have the quote in front of me, but it, it is um, strikingly familiar. He said, I saw the young man put on the disguise, in this case it was of a, of a calf bison. And he said, then he walked out amongst the herd. And so perfectly did he imitate every motion and sway in the antics of that animal that had I not seen him put on the disguise, I would have shot him thinking he was a calf. Uh, I read that 25 years ago or so, and then came across this. And so you can see that there is a, a pattern here of, uh, of a very deep-seated knowledge of animal behavior and animal biology that these people took advantage of and um, used it uh, as one of the ways of, of uh, being able to mingle near and amongst or at least in close proximity to the herds, which then they had a number of tricks for how they were going to move. And that, turns, that brings up my next point, which is that um, perhaps the most, single most important part about pronghorn Behavior and biology, because it's really innate, is this aspect of their curiosity. And again, I'm sure most of you have heard or are familiar with that. They are the most curious, we think, I'm not sure how you measure that, of North American uh, animals. Uh, they're just really compelled to investigate anything in their environment. They're just driven. They, they can't resist. It doesn't matter seemingly how uh, inane or stupid that activity seems. They're just going to do it. They're going to come around and look at whatever it is they see that's um, surprising or um, startling or unusual or doesn't seem to belong there. Uh, and as, uh, as I say on the slide, um, and I mentioned earlier, motion is really a critical aspect that um, people who work amongst uh, pronghorn, and it doesn't include me, will tell you that if you're stationary, if you stand or sit on the prairie and you're downwind, you can get very close to a herd. That uh, They will approach you, and when they're not looking, you can approach them. Just don't move when they're looking. Uh, but motion is a real flag. Any kind of movement, um, they become spooked and startled, and that's when they were, will, will be likely to bolt. Um, uh, and that relates to that vis visual acuity as well. But if you, uh, aside from that, this curiosity aspect will kick in, and they will just be just driven to check out something unusual in their environment. And so I have one more quote here I want to read for you about that, from, again, from an early uh, Western uh, explorer. The antelope possesses an unconquerable inquisitiveness of which the hunters often take advantage. The hunter, getting as near the animal as practical, conceals himself by laying down, then fixing a handkerchief or cap upon the end of his ramrod, continuing to wave it, remaining concealed. The animal, after a long contest between curiosity and fear, at length approaches near enough to become a sacrifice to the former. People had nice ways of writing back in the old days, you know. So um, what, we're, um, what we're seeing here is uh, uh, a, a building up of a story of the use of a number of tricks uh, to attract and to start to move animals uh, to a communal kill site. And um, uh, many of these were uh, based on this aspect of insatiable curiosity, uh, moving towards um, uh, uh, an object or something unusual in their environment. And I think what we're starting to see is, 
as, the, as how Aboriginal people saw they could start to move and control these herds. Um, there's a fair number of historic quotes that talk about these combined aspects of visual acutiveness, acute, acutivity, I guess, and, uh, and their sense of curiosity, and in the sense of a, this is a maladaptive trait. Um, these animals are so stupid, you could you set up a lawn chair and sit out and wait for them with a gun on your lap, and they walk up to you and you shoot them. And nobody who wrote about that, and who personally did it, ever saw this as a, as a very adaptive <laughs> uh, trait. But in fact, when you talk to wildlife biologists, they will tell you just the opposite. Um, this is a very adaptive trait for an animal that is by far the fastest animal in its environment. There is nothing even close to a pronghorn in terms of speed on the Great Plains. In fact, it's, this is an aside, but it's so fast, it's so faster, might be something that um, paleontologists find interesting as well. It's so much faster than any other predator that it doesn't make evolutionary sense. And it's led rise to a theory called the ghost, um, or maybe this is common for other species as well, but it's called a sort of a ghost species story. Uh, four pronghorns been raised by several wildlife biologists in the US that in fact what you're seeing is the remnant, it's the ghost, an adaptive trait of, uh, of the time when there were other predators that were far faster. And that would go back to the end of the Ice Age when there were saber-toothed cats and cheetahs and other things uh, in North America, uh, saber, uh, other types of cats as well, that were presumably extraordinarily fast. And the pronghorn evolved to become as fast or hopefully a little bit faster uh, than those predators, and then they all died out, and it is still uh, extraordinarily fast and only 10, well, 12,000 years later. Um, but that the, um, predator which the predators which caused it to become that way uh, have long since disappeared. Anyway, I think you'd make a very good case that uh, when you're by far the fastest thing out there, it's a very adaptive trait to, in fact, keep an eye on everything that's out there that you don't uh, understand, you don't know what it is, uh, it, it, uh, it arouses attention in some way. Uh, you can see it being very adaptive to keep circling up, investigating this, keep your eye on it, get, get occasionally close to it because uh, it can't possibly catch you. So um, while Westerners wrote, this animal is so stupid, you don't have to do anything to kill it. You just uh, go out and stand on the prairie and it'll walk right up to you. Uh, prior to guns, that was actually a pretty smart thing to do. Um, but things changed and... Uh, of course, pronghorn were almost wiped out. Now, um, with that rather lengthy background on pronghorn, um, I wanted to go into that at some length, partly because of the audience that I'm with today is uh, uh, giving a little more focus to um, the uh, animal behavior biology side. But uh, let's turn to a site where I think these animals were trapped and killed. And this won't take very long. I won't keep you much past noon here. Uh, it's called the Barnett Site. And uh, it's named after a friend of mine, Ron Barnett, who found it. Uh, he's a uh, amateur archaeologist and also a pilot and a farmer. And he flies around looking for medicine wheels, teepee rings, uh, anything of interest on the prairies. And occasionally spots things from the air. And when he does, uh, he calls me. And I head out and take a crew. And I've stayed at his farm many times. And uh, we've developed quite a great working relationship. And uh, he's been a big help to me. The dot there plots it. It's, as you can see, just north of the red deer, the lower red deer, so not too far from home. If you wanted to get in a, in a raft and sail down, there's Alkali Creek, and it is um, a few kilometers off uh, the um, western side of, the, of Alkali Creek, where there's an enormous number of archaeological sites in that area. This is a shot of that landscape. It is a rolling... Uh, bro uh, unbroken landscape in terms of cultivation, which is one of the reasons we find stone features out there like teepee rings. Uh, by far the most medicine wheels ever we know of in all of Alberta are from that area of sort of south from Oyen to about the, uh, the Red Deer and the confluence with the South Saskatchewan. That's really the hotbed of medicine wheels. And how much of that is a result of the fact that it's largely uncultivated, um, we'll never know. But there are a tremendous amount of stone features out here. In fact, when I plotted this on a map, um, I didn't throw that picture in, but if I plot this one site, virtually everything you can see in the landscape around you is also recorded as an archaeological site. And I could not believe somebody hadn't seen this. Um, they had walked right past it, apparently, on a number of occasions. 
That is the site, and those lines there um, show you the two stone drive lanes that I'm going to be talking about. In the far upper right corner is, the, uh, is Alkali Creek, which again, the, the breaks of that creek, are, uh, there's, there are thousands and thousands of teepee rings recorded in that area. You can see that this is, let me back up there, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's a very hummocky landscape. It's not very flat. It's very rolling, but not hilly. Uh, just hummocky. It's glacial ablation topography. Glaciers just sat down and melted and left kettle, knob and kettle type of topography in this area. Uh, and so it's not particularly good for farming and it's also, of course, very dry. There's a, uh, an aerial view where we've outlined the two drive lanes. I'm going to walk you through those a little bit uh, because that is the archaeological feature that tells us uh, about this site and hopefully um, is proof that it is, in fact, an antelope kill. Uh, which I cannot say for an absolute fact uh, today, uh, but hopefully one day I will. There's a look at it on the ground where I've traced out the, uh, the two lanes. There is a north, or sorry, the, it is a V-shaped funnel, as you saw in the other slides, and the V faces uh, the open end or wide end of the funnel faces almost due north and the narrow end almost due south. Uh, I don't know that that's so important as the fact that the south end of the funnel goes up to the edge of a fairly steep drop down from this uh, slightly raised landform. That you can see here that we're on a raised landform. You can also see there's a bit of a downhill run uh, to, the, to that funnel uh, leading down towards the drop. It's not, a, it's not a cliff or anything. It's about a 25 degree slope. Uh, it's a noticeable steep slope. Any animal running full tilt would suddenly encounter some serious difficulty. Uh, trip, fall, roll, etc. Uh, but it is far from uh, a lethal drop. There would be people there to kill the animals off, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So there's a west lane and an east lane, uh, and they are composed of uh, essentially cobble rock lines. And we'll look at these in a little more detail because this is, um, this is where we start to see human engineering and human patterning, patterning laid out on, a, on the landscape for us. Uh, this is what the archaeologist has in hand to look at and say, what were they doing, how did they do it, and what were the parameters of, how did they get the animals here, and which way did they bring them, and um, what were the important characteristics of building these things. Uh, a couple of shots just along the lanes. Uh, one thing about them is they're basically straight. There are no curves or twists in them. These are straight lines of rocks. Uh, that's a panoramic shot where I've mended together three photos looking from the so you're standing at the wide end of the funnel, in other words, the entrance, uh, and looking north onto that prairie from which somewhere out here the animals had to come from. If you want to get them into the funnel, which I'm standing at, they had to come from those three directions you see of the northwest, the north, or the northeast. And of the three, my suspicion is the right uh, side, uh, being the northeast. It leads down into a somewhat lower basin area, uh, more rolling. You can see down below there's a bit of a low area there. Uh, people who might be located on a higher ground would have more of a command uh, presence, commanding view, and also control, as opposed to animals up on higher ground. And we and pronghorn do tend to run uphill at times when they're uh, when they're threatened, and that may have been a factor. They could run up this rather gentle slope and then come into the entrance of the funnel. And to the left of the slide, which you can't really see here. Uh, but the, just, just to the left of the drive, the western lane of rocks, the land does rise up, um, which would then form a bit of a backstop. So if the animals were coming from the right side up this little gentle slope, and then the hunters wanted to turn them, they would have a bit of a landscape feature behind them to help turn those animals in the form of a, of a, a bit of a ridge to the western side. Here's another look. You can see some of the rocks are quite impressive, uh, 40, 50 centimeters in greatest dimension that I can see on the surface without digging them up. Uh, they are about half buried, which is a pretty substantial amount of burial. Uh, I don't have an age for the site, but I'll show you another one for which we do and um, make, perhaps make a suggestion regarding this one. Uh, there are, um, you can see a fair bit of engineering went into this. Uh, several human beings would be required to, to uh, bring, roll, lever a number of these rocks over. One person could not pick up some of them would weigh tens of kilograms and uh, would be out of the range of any one person. So you're seeing cooperative efforts here. Most of them, a single individual uh, could pick up. They're sort of cantaloupe to watermelon size, to put it in modern terms. 
This is another look at uh, close up at some of the lines. They are not stone cairns. Uh, this is important, I think. Some of you, if you've read literature about communal drives of some kind, you may be familiar with um, many, many communal drives, like, like buffalo drives, for example. Uh, they employed stone cairns, so individual cairns, little piles of rocks that are then spaced four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten meters apart, or sometimes very close, but they are not lines of rocks. Uh, and here, here we have that, and I think that's a reflection of a very different mentality and technology uh, of what they felt was required for moving these animals, and, um, and, and uh, that was then operationalized in how they built these structures. Uh, I didn't say at the outset, but will now. Um, there's only two of these known in North America, and they are both in Alberta, they're both in southern Alberta, and I found, or Ron Barnett found, and took me to the second one, that being the Barnett site. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple pictures of the other one in a moment. Um, and it's called the Laidlaw site, and it's, close, it's very, down right near the South Saskatchewan rivers. It's about 90 kilometers away, so actually very close. And these are the only two known st stone drive lanes in North America. There are many other antelope kills, and, and they employed brush lanes, uh, juniper, sagebrush, and these are mostly in the Great Basin. Some of them were used in historic times. They were witnessed by early explorers, and they were, they were brush. Uh, those people had a lot of brush, and uh, they made brush lanes. But in terms of stone drive lanes, there's only two that we know of, and, and this is the second one. I did a little analysis on the lanes, because that's what we have to work with right now. Uh, we counted the rocks in each lane. I should say, I guess, uh, the west lane is a little longer. It's about 65 meters long. Uh, the east lane is a little shorter. It's about 53 meters long. Uh, and yet the east lane has a bit more rock cover to it. And you remember I said that side slopes off gently down to uh, sort of a, a, an open uh, gathering area, whereas the west side, you can just see on the so side of the slide, it slopes up to a bit of a ridge. That may be why there's more rocks on the east side, because it was more open. It was more of an escape route, whereas the western side had more of a backstop to it. Uh, so although the west lane is longer, it actually has somewhat fewer rocks. You can see the counting of these is somewhat judgmental. You know, rocks, you know, we kind of took a meter wide strip and used that. Uh, but the ground is stony, so as you move off the lanes, there's stones a meter and a half away. Well, was that part of it? You know, we'll never know. And when we chart this, we see, although you saw the numbers for the lines, that's not a reflection of, uh, uh, of equal weighting. Um, the left side of this graph is at the funnel end, or actually downslope, uh, a little bit downslope from the, from the actual end of the funnel. And the right side is the wide end of the funnel. And then there's the bars for the two lanes. And you can see a very clear trend here. Uh, a rock loading at the narrow end and a diminishing number of rocks, that's per five meter interval as you move away from the narrow end. Clearly what people are doing is bolstering the most uh, tightly constricted part of the drive right at the uh, final, uh, the, the, the most, you know, what would undoubtedly have been the most difficult part where the animals are constrained into a smaller space being about 10 meters across between the two lanes as opposed to about 35 meters across at the open end. Now I'm going to show you a couple of features at, uh, at the site that are of interest. This is the very end of the drive. Remember I said it goes down a fairly good slope, but not a dramatic slope. Uh, that person standing on one lane, the, the shot is taken from the other lane. And uh, there's three things I want to show you um, about the site now that are all uh, clustered near the end. One of them is, that's another shot of the, you, you were looking at the break and slope on the far upper right, and then as the slope comes downhill, and you can clearly see the two lanes there. Notice that there's a line of rocks coming right off towards me where I'm standing taking this picture. I'm calling it the hook, and the little inset shows you that there's in fact a hook on both sides of the drive lanes right as it, as it crests the break and slope and starts to actually come down. So the lanes don't go right to the edge of the break. They actually go about five meters over the edge. And then they both make this right angle hook. Well, what's that all about? You know, <laughs> that it seems to be irrelevant in terms of moving them down slope uh, or through the funnel. You're now past that. You're on the downhill run. Why would they, in, clearly intentionally, you can see the, you know, this is not a, an accidental clustering of rocks. These are very solid lines of rocks coming off at a right angle. Well, I had some other experience in my career, and one of them was working in the Arctic recording caribou drives. And here's one I shot from the air. And note a beautiful V-shaped funnel, very similar to what we're looking at. And notice at the end, uh, they're not really hooks so much as crescents. 
and uh, they're sort of three-quarter circle. And those three-quarter circles are known to be from Inuit uh, ethno history. These are shooting pits for archers who wait at the narrow end of the funnel. Uh, and in fact, in the lower diagram, which you really can't see, you notice at the very bottom it says slot. And the slots are on a bit of an angle pointing away from the funnel uh, and pointing away from each other. And I looked at, it took me a while to look at that, and I realized, of course, two archers are positioned right across from each other at the narrow end of the funnel. Uh, <laughs> if those slots are right across from each other, you're going to loose arrows right into the next guy over across from you. And so they're actually turned slightly downhill, right? So that as you fire arrows, you're not shooting at your, uh, your colleague who's right across in the next little um, pit. So it occurred to me, and I don't know this for a fact, that, that those hooks at the end of those drive lanes there uh, could well be uh, stationary uh, points for archers who are waiting for the herd to come through. And off to an angle like that, they're going to be shooting downslope, not across at partners who are there. Then there's the depression that I've singled out here, and, and you can see the rock lines running down the slope slightly. And as you saw in previous slides too, there's quite a, I mean, there's, there's a slope down on each side of the, if you look at the two lanes, you can see there's a steep slope down. But in between those, there seems to be a distinct depression. Now, that is what I'm comparing to now the other site that I mentioned to you earlier. It's called the Laidlaw site. It's near the South Saskatchewan River. This was excavated uh, in the 1980s by a colleague of mine named John Brumley. And John had the V-shaped drive lanes and it's a much stonier landscape than the one I'm dealing with. But notice at the end, there's a, an actual rectangle there, uh, not just a pit. Excuse me, I'll... Uh, you can see this rectangle there of stone, and the drive lanes come like this, and then there seems to be a barrier here, and then a rectangle of stone. Well, John noticed that and uh, began excavations at the site and found that what, what this is, actually, this was a pit. This is a pit that was intentionally dug at the end of the drive lanes in which to drive the antelope. And that's actually a well-documented practice in the ethno-historic literature and to somewhat, to some extent, in the artistic literature. This is a drawing by Nicholas Point, and it actually may be of a Blackfoot uh, um, antelope trap. He doesn't, he's not clear, although he was in Montana and with the Blackfoot. Uh, it's unclear where he, he got the inspiration from. Uh, the environment doesn't look very plains-like, but he tended to do that in all his paintings, so it's hard to tell. But what he's showing, and what Clark Whistler and a number of other ethnographers document for the Blackfoot and other Northern Plains groups, is that they had communal methods of hunting bison, or sorry, antelope, that ended in a pit dug in the ground. And 10 to 20 antelope could fit into these pits, and then were slaughtered simply by clubbing them to death or using bows and arrows uh, from people who were located up above. So. Uh, are we looking at a, a pit there? I, don't, I haven't done any excavations yet. I intend to go back and run a trench across this and hopefully see the outline of whether or not a pit was excavated here. That may simply be a natural depression, and it may be, a, uh, in part, a factor for why they chose the specific location in which to put the antelope trap. And the final third thing I want to show you at this location is this thing I'm calling a stone structure. Again, uh, you can see it quite clearly in the aerial photos. Just off to the east side of the eastern lane, and quite near the end of the, of the break and slope on the drop down, there is this unusual uh, cluster of rocks. And you can see there's nothing else like it anywhere along either lane. And on the ground, when you get there, this is what it looks like. The lower right is a good example or a good shot of uh, actually seeing the rocks. The upper left gives you better context for it being located just about a meter and a half off the eastern lane. And it is a, a very dense cluster of rocks, about 55 of them, as I recall, in a bit of an oval shape, uh, about two and a half meters long and about uh, two meters wide. And what this is, is a puzzle. And uh, I have a suggestion uh, as to what it may be. And I go back to the Laidlaw, oops, sorry. I'll go back to the Laidlaw site in a moment. Uh, when John Brumley was excavating the Laidlaw site, uh, he found the drive lanes, he found that pit that I showed you, and then just off to the eastern side of the eastern lane, uh, right near the pit, he found an unusual circular mass of stones. This is sounding eerily familiar, isn't it? Uh, the cluster was about two and a half to three meters long and about two meters wide. His was more, somewhat more circular than mine. Um, and he uh, did some excavations around those to just confirm the layout of the rocks, but there was it was not, um, there was nothing really to excavate. There was no uh, pit there or anything. It was just a mass of rocks on the surface. 
And what he ended up concluding that he thought it might be uh, is the structure, uh, a structure that may have been specifically built for the use of a shaman or a medicine charmer, medicine man, medicine woman. Uh, this is a drawing from the 1940s from the Great Basin by a man named Julian Stewart, who was one of the famous ethnographers of people like the Paiute and the Shoshone uh, and the Utes and other people of the Great Basin. He spent most of his career with those people. All of them were antelope or pronghorn hunters, and all of them had a variety of sophisticated ways of, of killing large numbers at one time, almost always involving, as I mentioned, these brush fences and brush corrals that the animals were driven into. But in his documentation of that activity, he gives a lot of attention to the use of shamans, whose job it was to go out and call or lure these animals into the traps. That was the key to making these work, was that there were these medicine men, medicine women, these shamans, who went out and understood these tricks and, and uh, attributes of, of antelope behavior and biology and were able to, to bring these animals to the drives. And uh, so that is well documented. And you see he plotted a, um, a shaman structure just beyond the, uh, it's not in the ex identical place, but he specifically says the shaman always had a separate residence near the, near the trap where he would go to reside to call or lure these animals and then pray and chant and all that to, of course, make sure that the hunt was a success. And now back to Laidlaw, John Bromley, when he dug the site, in addition to having the pit feature, he identified this mass of stones right here, which he called feature two. And that to him, uh, he had no, no explanation for what that was. Um, he said, it doesn't, doesn't fit in anything we know about pronghorn hunting. He said it could well be um, a shaman structure. And so at the Barnett site, um, without, without any other idea of what that circular or oblong structure might be just off to the side of the lane, I'm suggesting the same, that it may well be a structure that was used by shaman or medicine people whose job it was to orchestrate and coordinate these hunts. Um, a picture I stole from a recent magazine of uh, Canadian Wildlife Service uh, having to do with um, you know, changing barbed wire fences so that we put uh, smooth wire under them. Uh, but it serves the purpose of um, making one of the final points I want to say about bringing antelope to kill sites like this and this the propensity of, to them, of them not to jump, uh, I'm sure when you, know, when you think about those incredibly small lines of rocks out on the prairie, um, if you picture that, I think, forget what I have next. No, I don't have it. Um, if you picture that landscape shot that you saw before and, and that enormous vast open plains beyond that to the north that, that the wide open funnel fed into, um, there's a sort of a staggering mental leap there to say, how did, they, how did they get these animals into that trap? And I think the role of the shaman was critical. And I think the shaman's role, to a large extent, was one of exploiting this aspect of curiosity, this innate driven curiosity of these animals. to and, and they could fog their mind. They could literally confuse them to, beyond, to the point where um, they could make them move in the, the directions they desired to, to go in doing things such as putting flags or ribbons on sticks in the ground. Uh, I think my last slide here is uh, one of people throwing their legs in the air, which is documented. They, they ran around on the prairie, catch their attention, lay down uh, so you're invisible for a period of time, then wave your feet in the air, put them back down again, and lo and behold, pronghorn just couldn't stand it. They just had to keep coming, investigate, investigate. And as you had a series, maybe a couple of people who were doing this in different locations, you, you slowly eke them and, and gently coerce them towards uh, an area where you could then, at a very late stage, uh, run them full tilt towards the drive lanes. <coughs> and I put this in to make the point that uh, we may never fully understand why some of these traps worked. Uh, those little stone lines I showed you from the Arctic, caribou ran no, down those to their death for four and a half thousand years or so. And bison ran alongside stone cairns on the prairies to their death for 10,000 years or more. Uh, antelope ran alongside these little stone lines. Um, horses will do it today. If, um, if they hadn't gone extinct, I think we would see mass horse kills as well. There are a few game animals of gre gregarious herd animals. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll take a drink of water here. that for reasons we don't really know, and I'm not sure we ever will, 
are prone to run alongside of things that are in their environment and not cross over them. And uh, pronghorns seem to be of that nature. And um, uh, so in my conclusion here, uh, in all the years I studied bison jumps and bison kills, I think it's literally quite true to say bison were driven to their death. They were driven to cliffs by knowledgeable, smart hunters who exploited aspects of bison behavior, bison biology. And they would run and move in, as a group in such a way that you could literally drive them as a herd <coughs> towards a kill. Pronghorn, I do not believe, were driven to communal kills such as the Barnett site. I think they were lured to their death through the use of tricks uh, and knowledge uh, by, by special people who were skilled and recognized by society as people who were the designated, the charmers of antelope, the ones whose job it was to cloud their minds and to bring them to these communal kills. <clears throat> and as my voice is failing me, that's a really good time to end. A few thank yous and to thank all of you for coming out today. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank <clears throat> you.